You know, like it or not, accidents are a really big part of driving. An estimated 49% of accidents actually happen in urban areas. 41% of those are at intersections. And at least in the United States, 92% of accidents happen in dry weather. According to a report in the 80s, this is really a multivariant problem. While we have safer cars and safer roads today, we also have cell phones. But, isn't, but even as we improve safety measures, the cost of society is great. And the personal cost can be even greater. 2.2 um, million Americans injured annually, 1.3 million deaths worldwide, an estimated $518 billion cost to society. And the personal cost, as I said, could be even higher. Safer driving is a big part of what we're trying to build at Automatic. Our device tethers with your phone over Bluetooth, and then we forward that every second uh, to our cloud services. This time series represents speeding during a trip. Hard braking is only one of the events that we detect, which is visualized above by the sharp drops in speed. It also happens that we have a 3D accelerometer built into the device, and so we can tell exactly how much g-force is happening at any moment. So, I mean, you can't go to a big data conference without somebody asking, like, so how big is your data? Um, <laughs> there aren't any roads in this image, as I mentioned before. Um, these are just paths of automatic cars driving across the US. Um, but this is one week of trips at automatic. Um, it covers most of the meaningful roads that I can think of, including like Key West and like goes off into Mexico. Um, but because I'm the boss, <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to talk about privacy. How do we use this data to build products for driving safety without compromising private user information? You know, 10 years ago, I, I don't think you could have imagined sharing where you're dining on Foursquare. But now that information is totally ubiquitous. Car data is going to get out into the public, but it's up to us to decide how to use it responsibly. Um, I love this because this is an ad from the 1912 Republican Convention for the automatic telephone. You can make secret phone calls without having to contact an operator. Every one of our devices has a unique encryption key. And we really firmly believe that it's your data. It's just our job to take care of it. You choose who has access to it. And we are going to do our absolute best that when we do aggregate information to build our next generation data products and create things like better public safety, that we keep user anonymity involved. We're actually going to try to demo for you that a little bit later. You know, some insights are actually really easy to uh, make anonymous, you know, hard accelerations by make, you know, turns out Mercedes-Benz tend to accelerate a little bit harder than BMWs. Um, we, we actually do have a whole bunch of sports cars in our data, but we're only doing ones that have at least, you know, I think 10,000 trips is the minimum for this graph. Um, and then, you know, the states that you want to get out of as quickly as possible. Sorry, anybody who's in the Midwest. <laughs> Um, it is effectively anonymous because you, we, we've removed any sort of user context. We noticed a great deal of questions we wanted to answer required thinking about where things occurred. But as an individual trip or finer granularity, in order to answer these questions, we would have to look at potentially sensitive location data and do it in a scalable way, which was basically impossible until we started leveraging Spark. So, you know, we wanted to ask, what are the most dangerous intersections in San Francisco? What are the most dangerous segments of the 101? In order to do this, uh, as I said, we started looking at Spark, and frankly, what I did is I hired Arpin. So I'm going to let him take it from here. <laughs> I got to give you mine, I guess. Dun, dun, dun. There were two of us. Sorry about it. Okay. 
This is better? OK. So yeah, first talk issues, but we'll make it smoother for everybody else. Um, right, so we were talking about finding out where some of these, um, uh, you know, the questions we were answering about safety revolved around where things happen. Um, and you know, before we can kind of dig deeper into how to answering those questions using Spark, um, you know, let's take a minute to understand what location data we have and how it's represented. So this is what a typical automatic user's data looks like. Um, when visualized, we have a lot of interesting statistics around you know, the actual cost of fuel that you incur or you know, your actual fuel economy that you get from your vehicle. Uh, but I want to focus on sort of their location data or data about where they've been driving. So on this map, the gray lines are paths of automatic user strips, uh, and they're represented as encoded polylines. Um, the colored dots that you see are events that occur during uh, their trips, like you know, braking really hard or exceeding a certain speed threshold. And these are simply represented as uh, latitude and longitude pairs. Now, this data is really easy to visualize, but when you want to run queries against your data, you have to transform them into geometry objects. So in this case, uh, the events that we were talking about, which are essentially points, become point geometries. And the trip paths uh, become line geometries. Now, uh, let's look at the data that we would want to query automatics geodata against. So this pretty thing is a shape file. It is a well-known binary format that is used to represent uh, geographical areas as 2D shapes, like polygons, lines, etc. For example, the uh, boundary of a particular city or state would be a polygon. And uh, while this data is readily uh, in a format that makes it easy to query because the uh, geographical areas are already shaped, it, uh, it is not easy to visualize, as you can see. Um, another sort of format in which publicly available geodata is out there is GeoJSON. It's a really flexible format, and it's great for representing specific and custom locations that you might want to query against. So in this case, I am grabbing the shape of the Bay Bridge back in San Francisco and I get the resultant GeoJSON representation of the Bay Bridge effectively. And I can turn this into a polygon shape later on when I want to query it against our own data. So um, you know, most of the questions we want to ask about driving safety involve querying automatics own data, which were the lat long points and trip paths, against some publicly available data. So for example, one might ask, what are the most dangerous spots um, on the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. And um, you can see how we've kind of put together a geospatial query using both these sources of data. So the GeoJSON representation of the Bay Bridge that I just drew out um, is essentially um, JSON and gets loaded as a geometry object using a convenience function um, in most geospatial frameworks called uh, geom from GeoJSON, aptly named. At the same time, we select latitude and longitude pairs from our own tables and essentially perform a contains operation, which simply put is just checking whether a polygon contains a point in regular 2D geometry. And when we run this on Spark SQL, we get um, a nice visualization of just the raw events as they happen in this area. No additional processing has been done at this point, but simply by running this query, we can already try to uh, start eyeballing some you know, areas of concern or hotspots that we can see on the Bay Bridge. And we'll go into this in a little bit. So you know, geospatial queries like the one that we just ran, most geospatial queries under the hood end up becoming a, um, a quadratic uh, join. Um, you know, and it's quadratic in complexity. So for example, in this one, we are essentially iterating 
over a bunch of intersections. So if you imagine these could be intersections in a city like San Francisco, and we are also in, in a nested loop iterating over all the paths that we have data for in the city, which could be automatic trips taken inside San Francisco. And this sort of nested for loop um, you know, is what makes this quadratic. Um, you can think about a couple of ways in which you might optimize this or speed this up, uh, you know, depending on what you're using. If you're using a relational database, um, you could think about creating geospatial indices to speed this up. Or we thought maybe we could attack this with scale uh, by using something like Spark. So we you know, did the fair thing and tried out both approaches. This is what the um, same query looks like in Postgres when you load in PostGIS. Now PostGIS has become sort of the industrial standard for uh, geospatial queries on relational data. It's essentially a library um, that you can very easily integrate with Postgres. And um, this is what the query looks like to an analyst, you know, maybe running uh, this query. And this is what that query looks like to a systems engineer like myself. Um, so we set up Postgres with PostGIS on one of Amazon's most powerful instances and gave it to our on-staff mapping expert. And essentially, this machine had 32 cores and a really large amount of memory, but that's all that's getting used. So we felt that we were throwing a lot of money down the drain uh, with this approach. And um, you know, the, the reason this whole conference is happening because we know that scaling relational databases are really hard. So uh, no need to get into those details right now. Um, so you know, the other alternative was let's try to scale this out, you know, use something like Spark to do these geospatial queries. And you know, Spark uh, presented its own set of hurdles, which were more like you know, out of the box, Spark does not have a, you know, a full featured library, a single full featured library like PostGIS that you can just integrate and go to work. Um, so we essentially turned to the community to put together a lot of disparate utilities and libraries that were addressing smaller pieces of the puzzle. And we tried to make that into a full featured framework that we could use repeatedly and sort of set up a pipeline for our geospatial data coming in and us being able to analyze it. So let's kind of step through what we put together here and the problems that each piece is solving. So we had our automatic geodata, which was encoded polylines and lat long pairs. So we needed to load that into geometry objects before we could query that. So the geometry API Java library um, you know, helps us convert uh, essentially CSVs containing that data into RDDs um, of geometry objects, which are ready to query and process you know, using any Spark transformations. At the same time, uh, if you remember the shapefile and the GeoJSON formats, um, GeoJSON is still easier, but shapefiles are really hairy because they consist of it's not one CSV file, which is what we're used to ingesting in the MapReduce paradigm. It's actually a collection of four different types of binary files, each with their individual unique formats. So how do you get a shapefile into Hadoop or Spark for that matter? So we found this little utility, which was you know, a little buggy at first and required a little bit of fixing, um, that takes a directory containing a shapefile format and again loads it into a, geo uh, into a geometry RDD. Um, since these shape files are you know, things like city boundaries, um, intersections in a city, state boundaries, we wanted them to be constantly available for you know, an engineer or an analyst or someone from marketing to go in and query against. So we essentially loaded them into Spark SQL tables of geometry objects and some metadata describing said geometry. Um, and sort of the last thing we had to do to make this framework truly complete was, you know, we, we, as you know, if you listen to Rob's keynote, he was talking about data democracy. We want a system where anyone can go in and run these complicated geospatial queries, not just engineers or people who understand Spark. So to round out that story, what was essential was for a way for non-engineers to go in and easily express their queries. So the spatial framework for Hadoop. Um, essentially imports a lot of user-defined functions that help easily define geometries and also easily define the operations that you would perform on said geometries, like uh, whether a shape contains another shape or whether a line intersects a polygon, things like that. So if you remember our old um, you know, spatial join query of intersections with trip paths, now we can express the same query in Spark um, using two simple Spark operations and a map side join. So we flat map all our paths, and we essentially use the intersection data, which is sort of a bounded smaller data set, as a lookup table, a lookup broadcast uh, uh, variable, and then do a mapsoid join with those two pieces of data. 
So what we ended up achieving at the end of this was um, you know, a framework which had feature parity with you know, post gis type other libraries for relational data. And we didn't need to do any sort of fancy optimization to make sure this customized systems work. Additionally, we could also scale our resources up and down as required based on query load or query type. And we could also, um, it was really easy to you know, take the results of these geospatial queries programmatically forward for additional processing. And you can imagine setting up a pipeline where data comes in. We do the uh, geospatial processing in Spark and then export the results and process them and transform them in other ways, which is kind of hard to do with SQL because it's harder to express programmatic things. So once we had this set up, you know, the first question we wanted to ask ourselves is, is automatic data telling the truth? We have all this data from our users, um, and it looks really good, but you know, can we validate this against historically known data about you know, traffic flow or you know, safety information? So we started with you know, a city we understood really well, San Francisco, and census data regarding its traffic flow. Uh, this data is actually fairly expensive to collect if you think about how you know, the authorities collect it. It involves mechanical infrastructure like laying pneumatic tubes across the streets or cutting induction loops uh, into the road. Uh, not only are these methods mechanical and involve infrastructure and are expensive, they also add a significant amount of latency um, to you know, when the data co thus collected is available for processing and analysis. So we visualized the you know, traffic flow data that we got from the SF census data um, and by neighborhood. And darker colors essentially mean more traffic flowing through that neighborhood. Um, now, one thing to remember is that apart from using those mechanical methods I described, um, a lot of statistical modeling is added to this data you know, before it's made available to sort of round the data out. On the other hand, this is data collected from automatic. What we, this is the, purely the raw automatic data. We haven't done any processing to it. It is purely a spatial join, as I described before, of neighborhood shape files with automatic trip paths. And again, the color scheme indicates, uh, darker colors indicate heavier traffic. And we see that it matches up fairly accurately uh, with the census data. One known omission is that big chunk of land on the left side of the city, which is essentially Golden Gate Park. And the reason for that is there's a lot of commercial traffic uh, going through that particular neighborhood, that particular area, and we just currently, being a consumer product, do not have enough visibility into those kind of vehicles and that traffic data. But you know, it, it, overall, we were fairly impressed by what our data was telling us. Uh, another example of that is you know, the Bay Bridge data that we were analyzing a short while before. So hard bricks on the Bay Bridge, uh, when we ran our Spark SQL query, we were able to identify certain hotspots, and one of them that was especially bad was um, you know, the Treasure Island exit right in the middle of the bridge. And as you can see on the left, there's each dot represents a hard break incident, and there's a whole lot of them concentrated in one particular point. And the picture on the right explains why that is. It's a notoriously uh, famous and really short on-ramp, which makes it very hard both for people trying to speed up to join um, highway traffic and for you know, people on the highway to slow down to accommodate them. So it's a really telling story, and turns out that the local media agrees with us. And this has consistently been ranked high on you know, the Bay Area's riskiest on-ramps. Now, you know, after having done this, we realized our data is clearly powerful. Um, but you know, we've made a commitment to protecting our users' data and interests. So you know, now that we're looking at individual trips, we're looking at individual hard break or hard acceleration events, um, you know, things like the origin and destination of trips um, are visible and could easily be used to single out or identify individual users. Uh, by and large, we try to st strip out this information with some randomization to help protect the identities of our users before using any of this data for analysis. And what we're going to demonstrate to you is how we've extended the geospatial um, processing queries that I just described into Spark streaming and how we're using that to anonymize um, user trips to some extent. So, um, you know, as our users complete trips and they arrive at our back end, we anonymize them before using any of that data for you know, any kind of analysis. So we can perform a geospatial query in Spark Streaming to remove the first 200 meters and the last 200 meters of all trips um, to essentially remove um, any way to identify the users, maybe home or office or uh, you know, other well-known locations that they tend to visit. 
Uh, so we can go from this original trip of a particular user to this snipped anonymized trip with the um, start and end um, distances removed. And we can do this in real time using Spark streaming. So um, Pusher is a pretty well-known um, PubSub service that can be used for messaging. And we use it for um, transporting our events between various microservices that we have in our backend. So um, the first thing we did was build a Pusher receiver for Spark streaming. So, and you can see that on the left, so that we can listen on certain Pusher channels and create a discretized Pusher stream. Um, and receive messages off of Pusher and feed them into Spark Streaming. Um, and then our star Spark Streaming job for anonymization pretty much looks like um, this. We ingest um, trip paths in a format known as well-known text. That is, even though the name sounds kind of generic, it's a pretty, um, it's well-known as the name says. It's a well-known text-based format for representing trips. And so we take in um, a mini batch, an RDD in a mini batch, and we essentially convert all the trips that we received in that period in a well-known text format into trip path geometry objects. The second step we do is, uh, so we read them in, and then uh, if you look at the above trip path, it essentially ha was represented using only five latitude and longitude pairs representing the points where the line turns. So we make that trip geometry much more dense by ensuring that it has a latitude and longitude point at um, every five meters. And we do this so that we can accurately strip out distances of any sort of distance that we want from the start and the end. So this remains a line geometry, but becomes much more denser in terms of the number of coordinates that it takes to define that line. And this um, last step is sort of the crux of the entire operation. We are using you know, some of the geospatial libraries that I mentioned to index this line geometry by length so that we, instead of referring to each coordinate by an index of 0, 1, or 2, we can literally go in and say, give me a point that's at um, 200 meters from the start, or give me a point that's at 200 meters from the end. So once we've converted this line geometry to a length indexed line geometry, that's when we can extract a subsection from it based purely on length offsets from the start and the end. And then as in the final step, we uh, send the anonymized strips back to pusher using a for each operation, the result of which you can see over here. Now it's, it's up, okay, awesome. So this is um, something we put together using the anonymization logic in Spark Streaming that I just spoke about. So what it represents are you know, trips taken by automatic users. Um, it has been running only since the start of this talk. So since that time, we've had about 3,000 trips finish from our entire user base, and we've had you know, 26,000 miles driven. And if we zoom in, you should probably do that. I'll keep talking. So you know, we put together this uh, kind of proof of concept that we wanted to do trip anonymization um, in Spark streaming and visualize the results. So initially, we had numbers about you know, how big our data is, as Rob said, and how many trips were happening in a day, and how many trips the average user took. But when we put this together and really could see trips finishing in real time, it was kind of humbling and you know, made us think that uh, having this um, you know, tr traffic data available in real time could really change the way we think about you know, traffic census data or driving safety data. Um, you know, if you have this data coming in right from the vehicle in real time. And uh, you know, this is kind of a first step this trip anonymization part that I just spoke about in Spark Streaming is sort of the really first step of a vision we have at Automatic of essentially having real-time channels of um, traffic data or traffic safety data available for you know, consumption um, and you know, have it in real time with the data like this flowing through it. Uh, we obviously have a lot of thought leadership to put in here before we can make any of this publicly available. But at Automatic, we feel that we can truly leverage technologies like Spark to uh, as a first step towards you know this vision of um, you know smarter and much safer driving. Thank you. You guys have any questions? <laughs> sure. Any question, guys? What does the consumer get out of all this data? I mean, this is not. Uh, I mean, it's super cool, but. <laughs> 
I'm a driving a car and I have this device which I paid you money for. I forgot how you spell your name. How do you pronounce your name? Well, I mean, okay. our, our consumer offering does a lot of things for you. Just on its own, we're, without this data even being involved. Right. Uh, a lot of this are things we hope can drive future products for consumers. Like, I would like to take the most boring route possible home, you know, <laughs> or, uh, you know, actually understand how uh, your car's performance might change in different environments, like during winter or like as you're driving through other areas of the United States. Um, the, there's a lot of other kind of rich things that we're looking to build, sort of our new le line of data products using this sort of streaming data, but also maybe to in future inform municipalities on how to be safer. And so I think a lot of our consumers would really like to know that their city can make new steps for safer intersections um, and really improve the state of driving everywhere. Oh, sure. That, it's just an, an, exa an example. Uh, as, as he was saying, we have a lot of thought leadership before we'd even remotely consider putting something like this available. Uh, yeah, we don't make any real-time available data to anyone. Uh, this is not the full subset of data and also non it, more anonymized paths. We won't make this available until we're absolutely certain that we can have our users' best interests in mind. We've done research to show that most trips can be divided into three sort of zones of driving. There's neighborhood, there's city, and then highway where you just um, drive for longer distance in a consistent manner. So that neighborhood section is essentially what we're trying to anonymize. And you know, by doing some initial statistical modeling, a distance of 200 meters is something that we found kind of encompasses that. And is also sort of uh, amongst companies, this is all so nascent that amongst companies that actually have trip data, it's kind of considered like sort of a standard or an unwritten rule. Uh, but you're right that it can absolutely, once we have more data about individual users, it can absolutely be personalized for someone who lives maybe in a more rural area and it takes them about five miles to get to any other road where you, know, you can see other traffic. And so that would some, be something that would have to be personalized for them. Uh, yeah. Compress it a lot, actually. So yeah. the, we don't send one hertz data over the, the wire because that'd be really, really yeah. expensive. We only send sort of interesting events in real time. Um, so you know, like if you got into a crash, we would send that in real time. Right. But we're not going to send your uh, the temperature right. of your engine in real time. We're going to wait to process that at the end of the trip because we're going to need the full data in order to say the complete story of your trip. And we don't really want to distract you while you're driving anyhow. So it's better to process a lot of that data right at the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we do have real-time data. Um, we have a product that's called License Plus, and we did a bunch of research, and the research said that parents need to start to form open communication yeah. with their teenager. No. <laughs> and although I know a lot of dads would right. really like to have like CIA-level spying on their kids, right. We would highly <laughs> recommend that you use it as a dialogue right. where their your teen shares the driving information. I'm such a good driver. Dad, you should see. Let me take the car out more. Not, I'm going to spy on you right now. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's $99 in retail. All of you can go to store.automatic.com and get it uh, for 80 bucks today by putting in spark plugs. Yeah, so I mean, the, the truth is that we do a whole lot of processing to clean up really crappy GPS data. Otherwise, you would be driving through the sides of buildings, over oceans. It wouldn't work. Right, so what we do is we actually take all these velocities and other information to do a best fit on actual roads that you could drive on. Um, and then uh, 
you can start to, in aggregate, it's kind of evens out a little bit, but you can also use that updated information to say, it's more likely that you were on this road than off of it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.